4. Investor Profile An investor profile is a snapshot of the financial and personal factors that influence an individual's investment choices. Just as a life insurance agent must be knowledgeable about the investments he sells, so too must he have knowledge of the person who is investing. This knowledge is acquired through the creation of the investor profile. Every investor is unique. Some investing objectives are shared by many, such as the need to save for retirement. But how each person meets his objective or objectives is the result of individual characteristics and choices. To develop the knowledge needed to create the investor profile, the agent must review. Black Small Square the assets and liabilities of the client to determine his overall financial situation. Black Small Square personal factors that may affect the client's investment decisions. Black Small Square client needs and objectives. Black Small Square sources of income during retirement. Black Small Square programs and savings plans that can help the client to save and meet his needs. The profile, therefore, gathers a lot of information. These details are used to develop investment recommendations that align an investor with the investments most suitable to his needs. The agent should take into account all aspects of the client's situation that have a financial impact and not limit his analysis to the elements mentioned in this chapter. For point 1 Financial Situation of the Investor An analysis of personal finances begins with information about assets and liabilities. This information is gathered so the client's financial position may be evaluated through a net worth statement and a cash flow statement. The net worth statement lists assets and subtracts liabilities. Among assets may be savings and or investments that the agent can analyze for current suitability. He may find a need to bring forward recommendations to the client that, for instance, could increase returns or decrease risk. The result of compiling the net worth statement is to show whether the investor has a positive net worth good or a negative net worth bad. The cash flow statement lists income, inflow, and expenses, outflow. The bottom line reveals whether the investor earned more than he spent. A positive cash flow indicates that money is available for spending, saving, and investing. A negative cash flow means that more is being spent than being earned, an unsustainable financial position. For point 1.1 1 .1 .1 review of assets anything a person owns that has cash value is considered an asset. The single most valuable asset most people own is their principal residence. Personal assets also include other types of real estate, cash, registered and non-registered investments, government retirement pensions, CPP slash QPP, and OAS, employer pension plan savings, the cash value of life insurance, fine jewelry, art cars and boats and specialized equipment such as tools or cameras. Assets are important for both the market value they contribute to net worth and the collateral they provide for the purpose of borrowing. The purpose of reviewing personal assets is to see the plus side of the balance sheet or net worth statement. This shows the value of personal assets, it can show progress made in building worth. The cash flow statement shows the rate at which assets are being accumulated or used. The following are some of the documents that provide information about an investor's personal. Assets, Black Small Square Income Tax Return, Black Small Square Registered Retirement Savings Plan, RRSP, Statements, Black Small Square Non-Registered Investment Account Statements, Black Small Square Employer Provided Pension Plan Statements, Black Small Square Bank Statements, Black Small Square Life Insurance Policies, Black Small Square Other Asset Sources. For .1.1.1 Income Tax Return Personal Income is reported on the Annual Income Tax Return. After the income tax return is filed, the Notice of Assessment, NOA, is produced by the Canada Revenue Agency, CRA. Taxpayers in Quebec receive an NOA from Revenue Quebec. The key information shown in the personal income tax return is black small square amount of taxable income, black small square how that income is earned, black small square use of tax credits and deductions, including registered retirement savings plan, RRSP, contributions. The NOA summarizes black small square total income, black small square amount of tax paid, black small square amount of tax owed, black small square tax credits received, black small square deduction room available for an RRSP, 
Black Small Square and used net capital losses, Black Small Square tax-free savings account, TFSA, contributions, withdrawals and in used contribution room, Black Small Square other necessary repayments, carry forwards and rebate information. Income can be earned from many sources in addition to employment. It can be generated by a personal business, from retirement pensions, from disability pensions, from investments, or from spousal support, among others. Dependability of the income is key to planning. For instance, business income could vary year to year, but income from a Canada Pension Plan, CPP, slash Quebec Pension Plan, QPP, retirement pension would be stable, rising only in step with inflation. From this information, the investor and agent know what can be counted on for income in future years. Contributions made to registered savings plans illustrate the investor's current dedication to savings. The deduction limit for RRSPs is calculated based on earned income. It shows whether contributions are currently maximized and is a basis for planning future savings. Tax credits and other deductions reduce income tax. Charitable giving is reflected in the charitable. Donation credit. The pension income tax credit can show whether a strategy for splitting retirement. Income could be implemented since the tax credit must be claimed before income splitting can occur. The taxpayer generally pays tax at his marginal tax rate, MTR, which combines federal and provincial tax rates. The MTR is the rate of income tax applied to the next dollar of income earned. The MTR is a key consideration when choosing investments and planning on using investment income due to its impact on the net amount available for retirement. For .1.1.2 Registered Retirement Savings Plan, RRSP, statement regular statements are issued by the financial institution where an RRSP is held. The statement is a summary of the account. An RRSP statement can show many details including black small square sum invested, Black Small Square Growth of the Sum Invested Segregated Funds and Annuities Chapter 4 Investor Profile 111 Black Small Square How the Sum is Invested Black Small Square Whether the Account Holds Locked-in Funds Black Small Square Withdrawals An individual may have multiple RRSP statements because there is no limit to the number of RRSP accounts a person may have. However, annual contributions to all accounts, including a person's own RRSP and a spousal RRSP, are limited to the annual individual maximum, plus the available deduction limit, which includes the carry-forward of unused deductions from previous years. An over-contribution of $2,000 over and above this amount is permitted before penalties are incurred however this sum is not tax-deductible. It can be very important for an agent to see how the money deposited to the RRSP is invested. It could reveal investing expertise and knowledge, the investor's exposure to risk, portfolio diversification and maturity dates. For instance, an investment such as a 5-year guaranteed investment certificate, GIC, has a 5-year term to maturity. The agent or investor should not plan to access those funds in the GIC until after its maturity date because it may not be redeemable or penalties may be applied to the withdrawal. An account with locked-in funds has restrictions on transfers and withdrawals. The money is locked in because it has been transferred from a registered pension plan, RPP, or another locked-in account. Locked-in accounts will be addressed later in this chapter. Withdrawals from an RRSP may show the investor has had an exceptional expense or has a need to supplement his income. If withdrawals seem to occur regularly, a conversion of the account to a registered retirement income fund, RRIF, or annuity may be advisable. The absence of an RRSP statement can also be revealing. It may show the investor does not understand the significance of having an RRSP or does not have funds available for saving in an RRSP. If the RRSP has been closed because the investor has exceeded the age limit for owning an RRSP, statements from other types of registered accounts may be available. An agent uses the RRSP statement to discern the value of this asset in the overall assets of the investor. For .1.1.3 non-registered investment account statements. Just like an RRSP statement, A statement from a non-registered or taxable account will summarize the key aspects of this investment account. 
Unlike an RRSP, there are no limitations imposed by the Income Tax Act on either deposits to the account or withdrawals. This statement provides additional detail about the investor's approach to investing and how much is available to contribute to net worth. For .1.1. For Pension Plan Statements A pension plan statement, also known as a member's benefit statement, is issued annually by employers who have a pension plan in place for their employees. In 2019, there were just over 16,600 registered pension plans in Canada representing about 6.3 million members.16. An employer pension is a valuable asset since the savings in the plan can provide a source of retirement income. The statement may include the expected value of the pension to be received at the usual retirement age. Other information can include contributions made during the year and the expected retirement date. This information is fundamental to knowing how much will be paid and when. Contributions made to an RPP by an individual as well as calculated pension adjustments PAs, reduce his RRSP deduction limit. For .1.1.5 Bank Statements Some people use bank savings as an investment. Therefore, it is essential to review the bank statements for a savings account to determine how much the bank account contributes to total assets. For .1.1.6 Life Insurance Policies Life insurance policies with cash value, i.e., whole life insurance and universal life insurance, are an asset due to the values that can be accessed by the policy owner. The cash may be received as cash surrender value or through a policy loan. Universal life insurance may also permit withdrawals to be made. For .1.1.7 Other Asset Sources there are many other assets that have worth or contribute to worth. For instance, Black Small Square a business owner has asset value in his business in proportion to his share of ownership. Black Small Square an inventor or designer may have an asset in a patent or intellectual property and receive royalty income. Black Small Square a real estate investor may have income properties with asset value and receive rental income. Black Small Square as mentioned previously, both CPP slash QPP and OAS can be significant assets to their recipients. An online resource called the Canadian Retirement Income Calculator can help determine the contribution made by these plans.17. All possible assets should be compiled in the financial review. For point 1.2 Review of Liabilities while assets contribute positively to personal worth, liabilities reduce it. Liabilities are debt and financial obligations that must be repaid. Sometimes a distinction is made between good debt and bad debt. Good debt is borrowing taken on in order to increase assets. For instance, a mortgage may be considered good debt under this definition. A loan taken for the purpose of investment might also be considered good debt. Bad debt is debt that depletes income and financial resources, such as credit card debt that arises from shopping, dining out, and holidays. Regardless of whether the debt is good or bad, the borrower must be able to meet its repayment terms. Both types of debt should be included in the review of liabilities. Debt, both good and bad, is a significant burden for Canadians. As of April 2021, Statistics Canada measured total household liabilities, at almost $2.50 trillion.18 mortgages lead the way for the total amount of debt, followed by credit card balances. Even a small increase in interest rates will increase consumer debt payments, while paradoxically increasing investment interest returns. Consumers need to prepare for such an eventuality by ensuring income exceeds liabilities with a margin for increasing costs. The following documents, among others, provide information about an investor's personal liabilities. Black Small Square Mortgage Statement Black Small Square Line of Credit Statement Black Small Square Credit Card Statements For .1.2.1 Mortgage Statement Just as a person's home is probably his single most valuable asset, his mortgage on that home is likely to be his single biggest liability. A mortgage statement is issued annually by the financial institution that holds the mortgage on the property. 
Its key information is the amount owed, the principal and interest charge of each mortgage payment, the interest rate applied to the mortgage, the mortgage term, and its amortization. A reverse mortgage may have been issued on a home. A reverse mortgage is a payment of a portion of home equity to the homeowner in a lump sum or a series of payments. It is a liability that must be repaid if the owner sells the house or dies. There may be estate planning considerations because the repayment of the mortgage will reduce proceeds from the property for inheritors. For dot 1.2.2 line of credit statement. A line of credit may be extended by a financial institution to an individual based on his creditworthiness or to homeowners based on the equity in their home. When a line of credit is based on the home, it is called a home equity line of credit or HALOC. The statement issued by the financial institution will show the amount owed, the minimum monthly payment required and the interest rate charged against the amount of loan extended. For dot 1.2.3 credit card statements. Credit card statements are issued monthly when money is owed and detail charges incurred during the month, a separate charge for interest and cash advances, balance of the account and the minimum monthly payment. For point 1.3 financial position of client. All the details on assets and liabilities are compiled to form a financial profile in the net worth statement. Income and expenses appear in the cash flow statement and are added to the profile. The result shows the possible amount available for investing. For dot 1.3.1 net worth statement. A net worth statement is developed by listing all assets at their market value and subtracting all liabilities. The final sum is the net worth of the individual or couple whose assets and liabilities are listed. Net worth equals value of all assets value of all liabilities. A common goal of financial planning is to increase net worth in order to achieve financial objectives. This can be done by acquiring more assets, by increasing the value of existing assets, for instance, through a home renovation, and by decreasing liabilities. The net worth statement is prepared as a benchmark against which goals can be fixed and future increases in worth can be measured. Example Net worth statement for John and Jane H. as of a date. For dot 1.3.2 cash flow statement. The cash flow statement can be developed for a period of time as long as a year or as short as a month. It is most accurate when it is backed up with a budget based on actual spending patterns. The cash flow statement lists all sources of net income, income after income tax, and subtracts all expenses including debt payment for liabilities and potential child and spousal support. If a positive number results, money is available for spending, saving or investing. If a negative number results, a debt management solution may be required, savings may have to be used, or assets may need to be sold to pay down debt. Cash flow statement for John and Jane H. as of a date. For point two personal factors that affect investment. There are many personal factors and preferences that motivate investing decisions. They are valid considerations in the development of the investor profile. They may include Black small square personal values Black small square health concerns Black small square legal considerations Black small square personal risks for point 2.1 point personal values. Personal values affect both an approach to investing and the choice of investments. For instance, although saving for retirement dominates financial planning, it is not equally important to all people. Some may value saving for education over saving for retirement. Others again may value charitable giving over enlarging investment portfolios. Some will exercise their beliefs about values by choosing socially responsible investments. The agent must learn if values will affect decisions in order to develop appropriate recommendations. For point 2.2 two point two health concerns. It is said that one of the greatest threats to wealth is poor health. No one can predict if or when a life-changing illness or disease will occur. People of any age who contract a critical illness 
or who are severely and permanently injured may find they can no longer live independently and need to use their savings to pay for the cost of care. Older individuals may also find that they need care in their later years. The cost of home care or care provided in a facility can be high and diminish the value of an estate. It also introduces the risk of outliving one's money. However, it can be too late to ensure funds are available for health care and or independent living if the agent discovers this need when the client has already reached or is nearing the stage when care is required. Therefore, financial planning should take this personal factor into consideration well before the time that the money may be needed. This enables adequate savings to be earmarked for care in the event it is needed. The need to fund care in later life is also an opportunity for life agents to introduce long-term care insurance. The need to fund expenses of illness earlier in life could be explored in a discussion about disability insurance, critical illness insurance, and life insurance. The risk of disability is one that should be assessed with other health concerns. Disability can have a devastating immediate and lasting effect on income and concurrently on wealth accumulation. The risk is best managed by ensuring that disability income insurance is in place for the income earners of the family. Other health considerations that may impact the investor profile are the need to save to provide an income for a disabled child and the need to use financial resources to pay for care for aging parents. Life insurance needs should be assessed to determine whether coverage exists and whether it is adequate for income replacement and or estate purposes. Another health concern of which an agent must be aware is the mental capability of his client to make good investment decisions. Mental capacity can be impaired due to disability or it can become impaired due to advancing age. Demographics show that a huge population bubble the baby boomers are reaching their 70s. Some older adults have difficulty making financial decisions. Because of increasing lifespans, more and more clients are in their 80s and 90s. This is a period of life in which people must make rational and practical decisions about retirement income and their estates. Therefore, the agent must be prepared to guide decision-making based on the knowledge he has developed of the client. He must also be alert to signs that decisions being made are inappropriate. For point 2.3 point Legal Considerations The investor profile must take into consideration legal obligations to others that have financial impact such as Black Small Square Family Law Considerations Black Small Square Will Black Small Square Power of Attorney, POA For.2.3.1 Family Law A person in a married or common law relationship, except in Quebec, for common law relationships, whether same sex or opposite sex, has a legal financial duty to his spouse when they separate and divorce. Family law, at its simplest, attempts to equalize the assets of both parties in these circumstances. This includes investment property. Therefore, both spouses have rights in regard to investments and their assets acquired during marriage. A parent also has financial responsibilities to children, from both a previous marriage and a current marriage. If child or spousal support has been ordered, it must be paid and its cost factored into financial obligations and liabilities. For.2.3.2 Will Developing the investor profile calls for a review of the will to see what commitments are planned for the value of the estate. Will review is part of the estate planning process. Agents do a valuable service for their clients when they ensure a professionally prepared will is in place. Dying without a will costs the estate of the deceased time and money, and there is no certainty the wishes of the deceased will be honored. Bequests in the will must be backed up with the necessary financial resources, or they may remain unfulfilled. A surviving spouse can generally receive the assets of a deceased spouse on a rollover basis, meaning that any taxes are deferred until the death of the second spouse. Meeting bequests made in the will takes careful planning. If investment proceeds are slated for a particular purpose, such as paying the capital gains tax on a second home, then the gifter will want to ensure enough money is going to be available for the inheritor of the property. Such cases may call for investments with guarantees, so the gifter is assured his wishes may be carried out. Segregated funds are one choice. 
an accumulation annuity is another. Life insurance is, of course, very important for fulfilling estate plans. For dot two dot three dot three power of attorney (POA) for property. Although there are provincial differences in power of attorney (POA) at its core, the POA is a document that nominates a person to make decisions and act for another when specified circumstances arise. It often accompanies a will but is invoked when the individual who has created the POA is unable to act for himself either temporarily or permanently. This often arises due to medical issues. Developing the background knowledge needed for the investor profile should include whether a POA has been given, to whom, and what his powers are, in order to determine in what circumstances he should be consulted. A POA may be issued to address end-of-life health decisions or property issues. This manual concerns itself with the POA for property. The attorney in a POA is the individual name to assume decision-making for another. It is not necessarily a lawyer, although a lawyer could be named as attorney in a POA. It is often an individual known and trusted by the person making the POA, called the grantor. An agent should decline being named as an attorney and must exercise caution when confronted with an individual who is presenting himself as an attorney for property. The attorney is granted many powers, including switching and selling investments. Agents should be aware of the limitations on the attorney's powers. Including a restriction on changing life insurance beneficiaries, except in BC financial exploitation by attorneys, is a major problem. POA fraud is a criminal offence. For point two point for personal risks, each investor faces personal risks that can affect his plans for savings and investing, such as black small square low level of financial literacy, black small square risk of job loss. Black small square longevity risk. Black small square risk of bankruptcy. Black small square risk of leveraging. Black small square unforeseen expenses. For dot two dot for dot one low level of financial literacy. The Financial Consumer Agency of Canada 19 tells us that a financially literate person is someone who understands how the financial system works. How to manage their money and how to make choices that best suit their needs and homes. Financial literacy is the ability to understand basic matters of personal finance. Many individuals across the spectrums of age, education, and profession suffer from financial illiteracy. Never assume what a client seems to know or should know. Financial illiteracy refers to a lack of knowledge and understanding about financial products. This can lead to unnecessarily low risk tolerance, which in turn leads to low returns on investments, or unnecessarily high risk tolerance, which leads to investment losses. To properly fulfill his duties to the client, the agent should assess client financial literacy. Any shortcomings can be remedied with the information necessary for the client to properly understand the strengths and weaknesses of investing and proposed plans, as well as the effect of risk tolerance. Typically, an agent determines financial literacy by interactions with the client. Here are three basic questions that are used as a standard test for financial literacy. Twenty, incorporating them into a client conversation gave equip the agent with a sense of client knowledge, which can then be a basis for suitable recommendations. One, suppose you had one hundred dollars in a savings account and the interest rate was two percent per year. After five years. How much do you think you would have in the account if you left the money to grow? A. More than one hundred and two dollars. B. Exactly one hundred and two dollars. C. Less than one hundred and two dollars. Tests knowledge of compounding. Two. Imagine that the interest rate on your savings account was one percent per year and inflation was two percent per year. After one year, how much would you be able to buy with the money in this account? A more than today. B exactly the same as today. C less than today. Tests knowledge of inflation risk. Three buying a single company's stock usually provides a safer return than a stock mutual fund. A true. B false. Tests knowledge of diversification. The correct answers are. One A two. C 
3. B. Information must be appropriately communicated to the client, both in writing and verbally. An agent must be aware of language differences that impede understanding and, if appropriate, call on the use of an interpreter. The use of financial and industry jargon and acronyms, such as talking about an MTR instead of marginal tax rate, should be avoided. Educational resources are provided by insurers and other financial institutions, as well as financial regulators. Independent information can be accessed at sites, such as the Get Smarter About Money site.21. For.2.4.2 Risk of Job Loss Job loss due to layoffs or economic developments can have a devastating impact on investing. If job loss occurs, the investor profile should be reviewed immediately. Saving plans may need to be put on hold. For.2.4.3 Longevity Risk Lifespan is increasing. From 1995 to 1997, life expectancy at birth was an average of 78.4 years. By 2019, average life expectancy was 82.22. This means retirement savings must last longer. Longevity risk is the risk that a person continues to live past the point in time that savings are depleted. This is called outliving your money. Longevity risk can be diminished by investments that provide lifelong income, such as a life annuity or a guaranteed lifetime withdrawal benefit. For.2.4.4 for risk of bankruptcy. Bankruptcy can be experienced by an individual or a company. It is the inability to meet financial obligations to creditors. The risk is mitigated by financial management and for an individual, a careful selection of investments such as segregated funds that can provide creditor protection. For.2.4.5 risk of leveraging. Leveraging uses borrowed money to try and achieve a financial goal. Using this definition, some forms of leveraging, such as acquiring a mortgage in order to buy a home and develop the equity in the home, are quite common and safe. When leveraging is used to invest in non-guaranteed investments, the borrower takes on significant risk. If the investment loses value, he can lose principal plus the amount of loan invested. However, the loan must still be repaid adding even more to the losses of the investor. Therefore, while leverage can magnify returns since it gives the investor a larger sum to invest, it can also magnify losses since the investor loses his savings plus the borrowed sum. Knowledge of leverage being used is crucial to the investor profile since it speaks to investor goals and risk tolerance. For.2.4.6 Risk of Unforeseen Expenses Unforeseen expenses are exactly what their name suggests, expenses that arise unexpectedly and therefore cannot be planned for. Medical expenses are one category of expense often overlooked due to the assumption that provincial health plans cover all bills. In fact, many health care costs are not paid by provincial insurance. Investors should ensure they have an emergency fund to cover these expenses and should take immediate action if a large unforeseen expense arises that disrupts their savings and income needs. 4.3 Investor Needs The needs of the investor are fundamental to developing the investor profile because needs supersede wants. For example, an investor might want a 20% annual return on his investment, but he needs a guaranteed 9% sum available to build and sustain a retirement nest egg. To build his savings, the investor needs lower risk investments as he approaches retirement that can be relied upon to meet his goal. This rules out investments generating a 20% annual return since higher returns are invariably linked to higher risk. Needs, therefore, are the investor's motivation, their reason for exploring investment options and part of the basis for making investment decisions. The agent's role is to identify and understand needs that affect plans and decision making. These include black small square need for income, black small square need for retirement income, black small square need for tax efficiency, black small square need for emergency fund, black small square need for creditor proofing, black small square need for liquidity, black small square need for estate planning. Black small square need for diversification. Black small square need for investment management, black small square need for suitability, black small square other specific investment needs. 
For point three point one need for income income is required to meet the costs of living and for saving. Goals must be identified and assigned a dollar value to give meaning and purpose to savings plans. If income is insufficient or only sufficient for paying living costs, then any plans for savings must wait until income increases or costs decrease. For dot three dot one dot one individual or household income needs. There are three categories of individuals in which there will be a need to assess individual income needs. Black small square those who are unmarried and not in a common law relationship. Black small square the widowed. Black small square those who are separated or divorced. Individual income needs must be compared against individual expenses to produce a realistic picture of an individual's financial situation. Couples should be assessed on the basis of household or family income, which encompasses both income earners and household expenses. Care should be taken to include income needs associated with dependents for both individuals and couples. Income needs may be expressed for the present or the future. If an investor profile turns up a need for increased income in the present, the agent may want to review the budget of the individual to discern spending behavior. Meeting future income needs should be the focus of the investment plan. Such a plan is based on objectives for the future. For point three point two, need for retirement income. Retirement income is the money needed to meet expenses in retirement. Retirement income replaces or supplements employment income when a person retires. Income sources during retirement will include government retirement pension income, private pension income. Investment income and personal savings for retirement. It may also include employment income since some retirees choose to continue work or to re-enter the workforce after retiring. Business income may continue during retirement. The business owner may not be actively working in the company but still receive a salary or dividends. A major factor that can be easily overlooked when assessing how much income is needed during retirement is the income tax that will be due on amounts received. Therefore, spending should be based on net income, that is, the income remaining after tax. For dot three dot two dot one income splitting, income splitting is a strategy that can be explored to take advantage of the different marginal tax rates of spouses. When income splitting occurs, income is apportioned between spouses so that some of the income is moved to a spouse who pays tax at a lower marginal tax rate than the other. By putting income into the hands of a spouse who pays tax at a lower rate, money is saved. For dot three dot one dot one individual or household income needs, there are three categories of individuals in which there will be. Some examples of effective income splitting include 23. Opening a spousal or common law partner registered retirement savings plan (RRSP). This is called a spousal or common law partner plan. The higher income spouse contributes to the plan for the other spouse. This works for income splitting if the spouse receiving the contributions is in a lower tax bracket than the contributing spouse when withdrawals are made. Splitting pension income for those 65 and older, up to 50% of the annual income received from a lifetime annuity, registered pension plan (RRSP) annuity, registered retirement income fund (RIF), or deferred profit sharing plan (DPSP) annuity can be allocated to a spouse. The splitting for tax purposes is done via the tax return. Assigning Canada Pension Plan (CPP) benefits (CPP) can be shared between spouses who were contributors. Or between spouses when only one was a contributor. Technically, this is called an assignment. Quebec Pension Plan (QPP) sharing is also available for couples who are married or in a civil union, or living in a common law relationship of at least three years' duration. Example: David receives eighteen thousand six hundred and ninety dollars per year as a pension from his former employer. His marginal tax rate is thirty-seven percent. He could pay as much as six thousand nine hundred and fifteen dollars and thirty cents, eighteen thousand six hundred and ninety dollars times thirty-seven percent in income tax on his pension. David's wife Beth has a marginal tax rate of twenty-nine percent. David splits his pension with Beth, 
so they each declare $9,345, $18,690 divided by 2, as income. David's income tax payable becomes $3,457.65, $9,345, times 37%. Beth's income tax payable is $2,710.05, $9,345 times 29%. Together they pay $6,167.70 in income tax, $3,457.65 plus $2,710.05, a saving of $747.60. $6,915.30 to $6,167.70, compared to the tax due if David did not split his pension income. When income is split, there can be an additional advantage for the retiree who must repay old age security, OAS, pension benefits. The OAS pension is entirely forfeited by the pensioner when net income reaches a specified level and partly repaid when income exceeds a threshold level. Therefore, if income is reduced by income splitting, then the amount of repayment, also called the clawback, may be reduced. For point 3.3 point 3 need for tax efficiency. Income splitting is one way to reduce income tax. Using tax credits is another. Federal and provincial slash territorial tax credits are available. Some tax credits are non-refundable. They can reduce income tax, but if the total credits exceed federal tax, a refund is not issued for the balance. Qualifying for the pension income credit is a requirement for the spouse who receives the necessary pension income before income splitting can occur. Using the age credit is important for those who are 65 or older whose income is less than the annual limit. It can be transferred to a spouse for his use. Using all tax credits to which a taxpayer is entitled, no matter how small the amount, can help to ease the tax burden. For point 3.4 point need for emergency fund. An emergency fund is a readily available sum generally equivalent to a minimum of three months living expenses. It is to be used strictly for payment of unexpected expenses or to replace income that is suddenly lost. Having an emergency fund available will eliminate the need to use expensive ways to pay bills, such as a credit card cash advance. The review of assets shows whether a sum has been set aside for emergency purposes. If not, the agent can assist the investor to create an emergency fund with a high degree of liquidity to be available as needed. Many individuals count on using their HELIC, home equity line of credit, for emergency purposes. For point 3.5 need for creditor proofing. As seen in Chapter 2, a creditor is a person or company that is owed money by another. A creditor has rights and recourses to obtain repayment of the amount owed. An asset is creditor-proofed when a creditor cannot legally obtain a debtor's asset or its value for repayment. Creditor-proofing should not be an exercise undertaken on its own or the sole reason an investment is chosen. An investment should first be selected based on how it meets the full scope of client needs. If creditor-proofing is also available, it should be considered incidentally as a feature of an investment product. If it ever appears in bankruptcy proceedings that investments have been chosen to credit-proof their value and protect their seizure against payment of debt, the investments may be seized. An investment must be chosen for the contribution it makes to net worth, not avoidance of obligations. For point 3.6 need for liquidity. Liquidity is a measure of how easily a person or company can access cash at the lowest cost, including converting assets into cash. It goes hand in hand with the need for an emergency fund. Liquidity in some assets is important to protect a person in the event of a disaster or personal misfortune. For instance, if a person found himself in a serious medical condition while traveling without the benefit of travel medical insurance, he would need access to cash quickly to pay for needed medical care. The review of assets will show if there is liquidity in the investor's portfolio. For point 3.7 need for estate planning. Some people have a very strong desire to leave an inheritance when they die. The inheritance may be for children, 
family or friends, or for a charity. Such a need means careful estate planning so that bequests can be filled according to wishes. The net worth statement is very important to determine if assets are available for such purposes. For .3.7.1 Charitable Giving An interest in charitable giving is shown by a person who gives to others and puts a priority on needs outside his personal interests, such as the need to fund cancer research or the need to create a scholarship. Charitable giving is not always associated with estate planning and the death of a person who wants to donate to charity. Many people make charitable giving part of their lives and so it is very reasonable for them to continue their giving after death. An individual with the desire to donate to charity will want assurance that the sum he has planned to give will be available. A taxpayer can deduct up to 75% of his net income as a donation and receive the tax credit corresponding to the amount of donation and his marginal tax rate. In the year of death or year preceding death, up to 100% of net income can be claimed as a donation. For point 3.8 point need for diversification. A review of financial documents and investment statements may show a concentration of savings in a specific account or specific investment. As explained in Chapter 1, a lack of diversification opens up the possibility of risk and potential losses. For instance, an investor who invests solely in guaranteed investment certificates GICs, runs inflation risk, since returns of GICs can be lower than the increase of the cost of living. That person will experience a loss in his purchasing power over time if he does not diversify into an investment that pays a higher return. For point 3.9 point need for investment management. The review of assets and knowledge of the investor may reveal an investor who makes his own investing decisions but is not suitably invested for his age, risk tolerance or objectives. He may run unnecessary risks due to the choices he has made. An investor could also display a high degree of financial illiteracy by failing to read or understand his savings and investment statements. Such investors may benefit from professional investment management, such as the management provided by a segregated fund. April 3rd 10 Need for Suitability Suitability is a specific investment need that is very important to meet. It is a process undertaken by the agent in which he compares the features of an investment to the investor's investment objectives, constraints, and risk profile. The agent's goal is to make a recommendation suitable for the investor based on the information and direction that the investor has given the agent. Suitability evolves from needs analysis and know your client KYC. The more information and better understanding the agent has about the client, the more likely he will be successful in assessing suitability. The agent begins by seeking information from the investor about the purpose of the investment and his expectations, wants and needs. The investor must be clear about his objectives and concerns. The agent should never rely on old or outdated information. The agent then applies his knowledge of the client's objectives and limitations against investment characteristics. Through his research, for example, the agent arrives at certain funds that seem to align with investor needs. He brings those forward as recommendations to the investor. The investor may agree or disagree with the findings of the agent. If agreement is reached, then the investor may decide to proceed with the recommendations. If agreement is not reached, the agent must gain further understanding from the client about his reasons for rejecting the recommendations. The agent takes that information away and begins the research process again. Suitability is established at the time an investment is made and it should be re-examined if there are significant changes in the life of the investor, such as retirement. It also needs reassessment if characteristics of the investment itself change. Example Luis, a licensed life agent, has a meeting with Miriam to discuss an investment strategy. Miriam, 62, has just inherited $1 million in life insurance proceeds from her husband's policy. Miriam has lived very carefully all her life and has never had so much money before to manage. In conversation with Miriam, Luis discovers that she has zero risk tolerance. Miriam's primary concern, other than the safety of her capital, is to have additional money available to help her meet her retirement needs. 
she will retire in three years. In assessing a suitable investment for Miriam, Luis considers her age, her risk profile, and her time horizon. He also notes her lack of investment experience. Luis recommends a deferred term annuity to Miriam that will start at her retirement. Discussions with Miriam will determine the appropriate term for the annuity. April 3rd 11 Other Specific Investment Needs Many other specific needs may be uncovered in creating the investor profile. They can include Black Small Square A need for tax-advantaged investing because of an investor's high marginal tax rate. Black Small Square A need to protect against the effect of inflation because the investor starts receiving fixed income at a relatively young retirement age and has an expectation of at least average life expectancy. Black Small Square A need to grow assets to meet estate planning objectives, which could indicate a need to assume more risk in the portfolio for potentially higher returns. Black Small Square a need to preserve capital to buy investments, such as an annuity for income purposes, and also to meet estate planning goals. For point for government retirement pension income. The desire for a secure and adequate retirement income powers many savings plans and investing decisions. Government-provided retirement pensions are the starting point for assessing retirement income. Their contribution to income even though modest by the standards of some, is lifelong. Over a possible 25 or 30-year period of retirement, the input by government pensions can be quite significant easily in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and can relieve some pressure for other savings. The following government plans offer retirement pensions. Black Small Square Old Age Security, OAS. Black Small Square Canada and Quebec Pension Plans, CPP and QPP. Black Small Square Guaranteed Income Supplement, GIS, and Allowance. As mentioned previously, an online resource, the Canadian Retirement Income Calculator, is available to estimate retirement income point 24. The criteria related to eligibility, contributions and benefits of government retirement income evolve over time and through federal budgets. Information provided here is meant as an indication only. It is important for the agent to remain informed of current dollar limits for payments. For point for point one Old Age Security, OAS, Old Age Security, OAS, is a monthly retirement pension available for qualifying Canadians who are 65 and older and meet the requirements for legal status and residence in Canada. An individual may be automatically enrolled or he may need to apply to receive his pension. He may also defer starting his pension. OAS provides additional benefits for low-income earners. These are discussed later in this manual. For dot for dot one dot one OAS eligibility, it is not necessary to have ever worked to be eligible for OAS. On the other hand, OAS can be received by someone who continues to work. The pension is available to qualifying Canadians whether they live in Canada or outside the country. If living in Canada, an applicant must Black Small Square be 65 or older, Black Small Square be a Canadian citizen or a legal resident at the time the application is approved, Black Small Square have resided in Canada for at least 10 years after turning age 18. If living outside Canada, an applicant must, Black Small Square be 65 or older, Black Small Square be a Canadian citizen or a legal resident on the day before leaving Canada, Black Small Square have resided in Canada for at least 20 years after turning age 18. It is also possible to qualify for OAS and or a pension from another country if the applicant has lived in a country that has a social security agreement with Canada or has contributed to the social security system of that country. For dot for dot one dot two OAS contributions contributions are not made directly to OAS. The program is funded by general tax revenues of the Government of Canada. For dot for dot one dot three OAS benefits. The amount of retirement pension is determined by how long the individual has lived in Canada after age 18. It is paid as a full or partial pension, depending on eligibility. The partial pension is proportional to the number of years of residency. The benefit is adjusted upwards every January, April, July and October if there is an increase in the Consumer Price Index, CPI. 
It may stay the same if CPI does not change, but it never decreases. The pension can be deferred up to 60 months after becoming eligible and is increased for every month it is not received during the deferral period. The monthly payment is increased by 0.6%, 7.2% per year, up to a maximum of 36%, 7.2% times 5 years, at age 70. There is no requirement to start the pension at 70, however, there are no further increases to the amount received after age 70 except for increases linked to inflation. Example In 2021, Helena decides to defer receiving her OAS pension for one year because she is still working and has no need for the additional income. Her monthly benefit increases 0.6% per month over the year for a total increase of 7.2%, 0.6% times 12 months. If she had started the pension immediately, she would have received $618 monthly. By waiting 12 months, it will increase to $662 monthly, $618 plus 7.2%, in addition to any adjustments for CPI. The amount received as OAS pension is linked to income. The Income Tax Act establishes OAS payment thresholds. There are three levels of benefit. Black Small Square 100% of the benefit is received when a person earns less net income than the annual minimum threshold. Black Small Square a reduction to the benefit if he earns an amount between the minimum and the maximum threshold. Black Small Square no benefit if he earns more than the maximum threshold. The thresholds change annually. Agents should consult the Government of Canada 25 website on a yearly basis to validate the current annual threshold limits. For dot for dot one dot for taxation of benefits. OAS benefits are taxable income. When net income falls between the minimum and maximum threshold, a lump sum OAS repayment may be triggered and paid with the income tax return for the year. The repayment or clawback is currently 15% of the difference between net income and the threshold. Repayment equals net income threshold times 15%. Example. Ben earns $81,000 of net income in 2019. His income exceeds the threshold for 2019 set at $77,580. Therefore, he repays $513, $81,000 times 15% of his OAS pension with his income tax return for 2019. To avoid repaying large sums, Future benefits may be reduced by a recovery tax whereby a reduction is applied to monthly benefits rather than charged as a lump sum. A reconciliation is made annually taking income and threshold into account. If income falls below the minimum threshold, no recovery tax is charged. For Point for Point 2 Canada Pension Plan, CPP, and Quebec Pension Plan, QPP. The Canada Pension Plan, CPP, is a plan to which almost all workers between the ages of 18 and 70 and employers in Canada contribute. It provides a retirement pension, survivor's pension, disability benefit, and death benefit. The Quebec Pension Plan, QPP, is similar to the CPP for Quebec workers and employers and replaces the CPP in that province. There are some subtle differences between the two plans, such as the post-retirement benefit, which does not exist in Quebec although contributions must continue to the QPP if work continues while receiving retirement benefits. The QPP also uses a different set of determinants in regard to the surviving spouse of a QPP pensioner.26. For.2.1 dot for dot dot CPP eligibility. To be eligible for a retirement pension, a worker must have made one valid CPP contribution. An application must be made it cannot be submitted until one month after turning age 59. 26. For more information regarding the QPP, please consult the Ethics and Professional Practice, Quebec, e For dot for dot two dot two CPP contributions. The amount contributed to the CPP is based on employment income. This is called pensionable earnings. The minimum income at which contributions begin is $3,500 per year in 2021. 
those who earn less than this amount are not required to contribute. There is a maximum amount above which contributions are not made, called the year's maximum pensionable earnings, YMPE. Contributions are made at the rate of 10.9% of pensionable earnings in 2021. If employed, the contribution is split between the employer and worker. The self-employed pay the full amount based on net business income. The more contributed to the plan, the more eventually paid as a pension to a maximum. A certain number of lowest earning years can be dropped from the pension calculation so as not to drag down the average of all earnings and reduce the amount received in the pension. This is provided by the general dropout provision. The child rearing provision is the equivalent for a caregiver who has no earnings or low earnings because he stayed home to raise his children. Contributions to the CPP end when the pension begins at age 70 or at death. It is possible to begin receiving the CPP retirement pension while continuing to work. In that case, contributions to the CPP resume by the employee and employer, or by the self-employed, and they go towards the payment of the post-retirement benefit PRB. The PRB is a supplementary pension available to contributors. It is paid for life and added to the CPP benefit. It is mandatory to make contributions to the PRB between ages 60 and 65 if work continues. At age 65 contributions become voluntary. For dot for dot 2 dot 3 CPP benefits. The amount received as a monthly retirement pension benefit is a result of black small square the number of years contributions are made. Black small square the amount contributed. Black small square the age at which the pension begins. The pension is increased annually based on an increase in the cost of living as measured by the Consumer Price Index, CPI. The standard age to begin receiving the pension is 65. It can begin as early as age 60. When the pension begins early, the amount paid is reduced by the number of months the pension begins before age 65. The penalty for the early pension is 0.6% per month or 7.2% per year, 0.60 by 12 months. If a pensioner begins the pension five years early, his pension would be reduced by 36%, 7.2% times five years. Lorene will retire at age 60 in 2021. She would receive $657 and 90 cents from the CPP at age 65. However, by beginning five years early she incurs a reduction of 36%, 7.2% times five years. At 60, Lorene will receive $421.06, $657.90, $657.90 times 36% as her CPP retirement pension. The pension can also be enhanced by waiting. Every month the pension is not received for a pensioner who is 65 or older increases his benefit by 0.7%, 8.4% per year. A pensioner who waits the maximum of five years receives a 42% increase in the amount received, 8.4% times five years. There is no further enhancement after age 70. Example. Joseph decides the time for retirement will arrive when he turns 69 in 2021. This is a four-year delay from the standard retirement age of 65. As a result of waiting his CPP retirement pension is increased from its base, which would have been $922.44 at age 65, to $1,232.38 at age 69, $922.44 plus. 8.4% times $922.44 times for years. Recipients of the PRB receive a benefit based on earnings, CPP contributions made in the previous year, and the age at which the PRB begins. The maximum benefit for one year is equal to 1 40th of the maximum CPP retirement pension. The benefit is in proportion to contributions, for example, if PRB contributions are half the maximum, benefits are half the maximum. The CPP also provides a survivor's pension for the spouse and child or children of a deceased CPP contributor. Black small square the amount received by the spouse is based on his age, how long contributions were made, 
how much was contributed, and whether CPP retirement or disability benefits are already being received. Black Small Square The child's benefit is paid to age 18 or up to age 25 if the child is attending school, college or university full-time. The CPP also pays a disability benefit when the contributor becomes severely disabled for a prolonged time and a death benefit when the contributor dies. For dot for dot two dot for taxation of benefits. The CPP benefit is taxable income. For point for point three benefits for low income earners the guaranteed income supplement, GIS, and the allowance are monthly benefits paid to OAS recipients with a low income. These benefits are not taxable. A province may also offer a supplementary pension to its low-income retired residents. Recipients of these benefits will most likely not have sufficient income to invest. For dot for dot three dot one GIS eligibility, contributions and benefits to receive the GIS benefit it is necessary to be living in Canada. An applicant must be a legal Canadian resident and meet the annual income test based on net income reported on the federal income tax return. The application must be made in writing. Contributions are not made to GIS directly. The program is funded by government revenues. The GIS benefit is available beginning at age 65. The amount received depends on marital status and income. Income for a married couple is combined to determine the amount each spouse receives. For dot for dot three dot two allowance eligibility, contributions and benefits the allowance is available to those 60 to 64 years old and whose married or common law spouse receives the OAS and is eligible for GIS. It is not necessary to make contributions to receive the benefit. As with OAS and GIS, other eligibility criteria include years of residency and income. The allowance is paid as a set benefit. An allowance for the survivor is available to those with a low income, who are living in Canada and whose married or common-law spouse is deceased. For point five, employer-provided retirement pensions An employer-provided retirement pension is commonly called a company pension or private pension. Its purpose is to reward employees by paying a future retirement income. There are a number of forms a pension plan can take. These pensions are generically called registered pension plans, RPPs, Black Small Square defined benefit pension plans, DBPPs, Black Small Square defined contribution pension plans, DCPPs, Black Small Square pooled registered pension plans, PRPPs. All plans may be a combination of personal savings of the employee and contributions by an employer. Initially, the employer contributions to the employee's plan may be owned by the employer. After a period of time, their ownership is transferred to the employee. This helps to reward commitment to the employer. Therefore, the savings in an RPP are a valuable asset for plan members. However, the majority of Canadian workers are not members of an RPP. They must fund future retirement costs personally by saving through other plans, such as a Registered Retirement Savings Plan, RRSP. All public sector employers provide a retirement pension to their employees, including doctors and all medical personnel, teachers, members of the police and emergency services, and so on. Employees of firms that are federally regulated, such as bank employees, may be members of a pension plan that is registered federally. Private sector employers that offer a plan must register their plan with their provincial pension administrator. The provincial legislation where the plan is registered governs its terms and conditions. All provincial RPPs are also subject to federal legislation, such as the Income Tax Act. The plan sponsor, usually the employer, establishes and maintains the RPP. The plan administrator is a person or third party that has ultimate responsibility for plan administration, such as enrolling new members, issuing pension statements and keeping records. An accurate record is necessary if a plan member dies, retires or ceases to participate. Plan members receive a brochure or booklet explaining the terms of their plan when they join. As described above, employer contributions to a plan may become the property of the employee after a period of time. At the end of that period, the employer contributions vest with the employee that is, they are owned by the employee. In practice, vesting, 
the process by which contributions transfer from one to another can happen at any time. The rules are determined by the Pension Benefits Act of each jurisdiction in which the plan is registered. In the best case, vesting is immediate and the employee receives both his and his employer's contributions as of the first contribution. Less favorably, vesting occurs when the employee is required to stay a certain length of time with the employer before he is entitled to both contributions. Example Andrew has contributed to his employer's pension plan since he started work with the firm five years ago. His employer has also contributed to Andrew's plan. Andrew has recently been offered a more challenging position with a different employer. As Andrew changes jobs, he receives the value of all contributions made to his pension, his and his employers, in addition to the investment growth on those contributions because his benefits are vested. He transfers the total sum into a locked-in retirement account, Lira. Pension plan contributions, whether made by the employee or the employer, and growth of those contributions due to investment returns are locked in. Locked in means that an employee cannot access the value of his RPP until he reaches the retirement age specified in the plan of which he is a member or satisfies the terms of the locked in account to which he transfers his savings as a result of having changed employers. There are only a few, very specific circumstances in which the funds can be unlocked. Locked in funds are created in defined benefit pension plans, DBPPs, defined contribution pension plans, DCPPs, and pooled registered pension plans, PRPPs. It is mandatory that savings in these plans are locked in. Given the requirements and restrictions on the use of locked in plans, it is important to understand them and what a person required to use a locked in plan should expect. Locked in accounts are covered in more detail later in this chapter. An employee who is leaving a firm with vested funds, but is not retiring, has several choices for his pension savings. Black Small Square he may continue in a company pension plan. Black Small Square he may be able to leave the value of the pension in his former employer's plan. Black Small Square he may be able to transfer the pension value to the RPP of the new employer. Black Small Square he may transfer the pension value to a locked-in account at a financial institution. Black Small Square he may use the pension value to buy a deferred life annuity. An employee with a DBPP who never changes employers or who leaves his pension savings with an employer after he has left that employer to work elsewhere receives his pension from that employer during retirement. He has no need to transfer options or locked-in accounts. An employee with a DBPP or DCPP whose new employer also offers a pension plan may be able to transfer the value of his pension to the new employer. He will be bound by the terms of the new employer's plan. Not all employers permit another pension to be transferred to their plan. The plan of the new employer may or may not be more advantageous than the original plan. Regardless, if the employee has chosen to transfer this pension to their new plan, he will now be a member of that plan. The transfer is made directly from one employer to the other. An employee who is a member of a DBPP or DCPP may choose to transfer pension savings into a locked-in account when he changes employers. There are two phases to locked-in plans, a savings phase for contributions and an income phase that issues payments. Each phase requires use of the correct type of account. Withdrawals cannot be made from the savings account. When the savings account is wound up, its value rolls into the income account from which withdrawals are made. Only locked-in savings can fund the locked-in income account. A person who transfers his pension value to a savings phase locked-in account needs a locked-in RRSP, also called an LRSP, or locked-in retirement account, Lira, depending on where he lives. The individual becomes his own pension fund manager and is responsible for investment decisions that will affect his future standard of living. However, he gains an element of flexibility and control that he does not have as his funds remain in the company pension plan except that withdrawals are not allowed. The savings phase transitions into the income phase when the locked-in RRSP or Lira is converted to one of the following accounts that are structured to issue payments. This must occur no later than the end of the year in which the plan owner turns 71. 
Black Small Square Life Income Fund, LIF. Black Small Square Locked In Retirement Income Fund, LRIF. Black Small Square Prescribed Registered Retirement Income Fund, PRRIF, for those whose plans are registered in Saskatchewan or Manitoba. Black Small Square Restricted Life Income Fund, RLIF, for those with a federally regulated pension. An income stream is created because a minimum annual withdrawal must be taken from the LIF slash LRIF slash PRRIF slash RLIF account and paid to the account owner. There is a limit to the maximum annual withdrawal, except the PRRIF, which has no maximum. RPP contributors are not able to access the value of their locked-in plans before the age of retirement specified in their plan. The rationale for locking in plan value is based on the employer's commitment to provide a retirement pension for employees. A pension can only be provided if funds are available in the pension account. If funds are not locked in, withdrawals could be made and the account value reduced or depleted leaving less, little or nothing available when the individual retires. It is possible to unlock the value of the RPP under certain circumstances. They include cases of financial hardship, Shortened life expectancy, usually defined as two years or less, and a very low account balance point 27. A life annuity may also be purchased from a life insurer by transferring funds from the locked-in RRSP or Lira. If the life annuity is chosen, it also pays a regular income to its annuitant. An employee with a defined contribution pension plan, DCPP, has no option but to transfer his savings to a locked-in account when he retires. He cannot leave his pension savings with his employer. This provides a marketing opportunity for life agents to work with former DCPP members and help them to best invest their savings. It is possible for an employee to end up with multiple pensions from multiple employers. For example, an employee who has a defined benefit plan with one employer and a defined contribution plan with another receives the defined benefit plan pension and a separate income from his LIF, LRIF, PRIF, or annuity representing the contributions made to the second employer. Example Roger, age 58, had a defined contribution plan with his employer in Regina, SK. It vested 14 years ago. Roger is laid off and decides to transfer his pension plan contributions to a lira in which he can make the investment decisions. One year after being laid off, Roger accepts a new job. This employer provides a defined benefit plan pension. Roger joins the plan. On retirement, at age 67, Roger converts his lira to a PRRIF. He begins to make regular withdrawals from the PRRIF and receives a monthly pension check from his second employer. Contributions to an RPP reduce the Registered Retirement Savings Plan RRSP, deduction limit for the following year. This is called a Pension Adjustment PA. The PA is reported to the employee on his T4 Statement of Remuneration Paid or T4A Statement of Pension, Retirement, Annuity and Other Income. Example Heather receives a T4 from her employer showing a pension adjustment of $4,366 for the previous calendar year. Her RRSP deduction limit for this year is $7,880. However, the pension adjustment reduces her deduction limit to $3,514, $7,880 to $4,366. For point 5.1 point Defined Benefit Pension Plan, DBPP. The Defined Benefit Pension Plan, DBPP, is considered the gold standard of retirement pensions. It pays an income on retirement that is known in advance, lasts for life, has a provision for the spouse when the employee dies, and is often indexed to increases in the cost of living. Therefore, it makes a reliable contribution to retirement income needs. Fewer employers now offer this type of plan due to its obligations and expense. A member of a DBPP makes no investment decisions and the plan sponsor chooses the investments that will produce the promised pension at retirement. A DBPP is provided on a group basis to employees. It can be set up on an individual basis for business owners and directors and is then called an individual pension plan 
IPP. For .5.1.1 DBPP eligibility, a plan can be created for all employees of a company or a class of employees. For instance, unionized employees may be a class or non-unionized employees may be a class. When a pension plan is created for a class, every employee in that class is eligible to join the plan when he has worked the required length of time for plan membership. A full-time employee is eligible to join a plan after two years of continuous employment, called service, unless the terms of the plan permit the employee to join earlier. A part-time employee is eligible to join after 24 months of employment. He must meet one of two criteria, whichever is less 700 hours of work or 35% of the year's maximum pensionable earnings, YMP, in the preceding two years. For .5.1.2 DBPP contributions, the plan sponsor chooses a plan that is contributory or non-contributory. Black Small Square employees and the employer contribute to a contributory plan. Black Small Square only the employer contributes to a non-contributory plan. The employer's contribution to funding the pension plan is based on an actuarial estimation of the amount needed to fund future pensions. When a plan is contributory, an employee may be able to make additional voluntary contributions, AVC, that will produce a higher pension. These contributions are deposited into a separate account that is structured as a defined contribution pension plan, DCPP, in which the employee makes investment decisions. Such two-tiered plans are called combination plans or hybrid plans. An employee who is eligible for enrollment in his employer's DBPP can contribute for both current service and past service. This occurs if a pension plan is introduced by a sponsor, it recognizes employment retroactively. The maximum contribution limit per year is set at 1-9th of the sum available to contribute to a defined contribution pension plan, DCPP. This amount is determined by the Income Tax Act. For .5.1.3 DBPP benefits. As stated earlier, the distinguishing feature of DBPPs is that the employee knows before retirement the amount of pension he will receive. When the employee reaches the specified age at which the retirement pension begins, the employer begins issuing monthly pension payments. They will last for the life of the former employee and pay a partial spouse's pension if the death of the employee occurs before the death of the spouse. The amount received by the former employee is typically calculated in one of three ways. Black small square by final average earnings, based on average earnings in the years leading up to retirement. Black small square by career average earnings, based on average earnings during the entire period of plan membership. Black small square through a flat benefit, based on a fixed dollar amount for each year of plan membership. The rate at which benefits accrue cannot be more than 2% of a plan member's remuneration for the year to a maximum annual dollar amount. Some plans increase the benefit fully or partially in step with increases in the Consumer Price Index CPI. This helps to protect the benefit from inflation. A member of a DBPP can elect to receive the commuted value of his pension at retirement or when employment ceases. The commuted value is a lump sum payment representing the present value of the pension. The sum is calculated by an actuary taking many factors, such as interest rate and employee age, into account. Commuted values are locked in, and the sum must be transferred to another account that continues locking in, such as a lira. When the employee receives the commuted value he becomes his own pension manager and through his choice of investments will try to create lifelong income for himself and his spouse. Benefits can be jeopardized for members of DBPPs if the sponsor fails to make its necessary contributions to the plan. In this case the pension plan is said to be underfunded. On death of a DBPP member, his spouse is entitled to receive at least 60% of the pension. If there is no spouse, a beneficiary may receive a lump sum payment representing a commuted value of the pension. For point 5.2 Defined Contribution Pension Plan, DCPP. A defined contribution pension plan, DCPP, is also called a money purchase plan, MPP. 
The amount paid as retirement income for a DCPP member is entirely based on contributions and investment income that accumulate in the plan. The employer makes no commitments to the amount of pension that will be received. Therefore, the plan member does not know the income to expect during retirement. Employers have come to favor the DCPP over the DBPP precisely because the employer is relieved of the need to provide a predetermined pension to employees. Therefore, the cost of the plan to the employer is much less. A member of a DCPP decides how to invest contributions. He will be provided with a menu of investment choices and a default investment option. The default option is used when the member does not make another investment selection from the available choices. Therefore, the plan member is partly responsible for the sum available to him as a pension since the outcome of his investment decisions affects the final value of the plan. Of course, value is also determined by the amount and timing of contributions. For .5.2.1 DCPP eligibility, many employers require their full-time employees to join their DCPP plan, but other employers leave the decision to the employee. Part-time employees may be eligible to join. This information is obtained from the plan administrator. There is no required waiting period for full-time employees. Part-time employees may be required to meet the same eligibility requirements as for a DBPP. For .5.2.2 DCPP contributions. Contributions to a DCPP may be made by the employee and the employer. Employers are required to make a minimum contribution to their plan. Employee contributions are not mandatory and additional voluntary contributions may not be allowed. There is no contribution to a DCPP permitted for past service. The annual contribution limit is a dollar figure established by the Income Tax Act. The employer provides the employee with investment information and the employee chooses the investment or is assigned the default option. For .5.2.3 DCPP benefits. The retirement pension from a DCPP is a result of amount of the contributions when contributions are made and investment performance. There are no guarantees as to how much will be received as a pension. The pension is not paid by the employer that has sponsored the DCPP. At retirement, the funds in the plan must be transferred to a locked-in account. As stated previously, if the retiree has not reached the age at which he must begin receiving income, he can leave his savings in a locked-in savings account. If he must begin receiving income, he transfers his pension account value to an income-paying locked-in account or life annuity. For point 5.3 point Pooled Registered Pension Plan, PRPP The Pooled Registered Pension Plan, PRPP, is the newest form of pension. In Quebec, the plan is called the Voluntary Retirement Savings Plan, VRSP, and must be implemented if an employer has five or more employees and does not offer a registered pension plan. Plans are provincially registered by administrators. After registration, administrators offer the plan to employers and people who are self-employed. The administrator is not an employer but a third party that provides the PRPP and is responsible for its operations. A PRPP is a type of pension plan that is similar to a defined contribution plan, except that employer contributions are not mandatory. Its goal is to provide a low-cost retirement savings plan for those who are not members of RPPs or employer savings plans, such as a group RRSP. The plan is based on the concept of pooled contributions, which is a means of lowering member costs on fees. For .5.3.1 PRPP eligibility. Full-time employees are immediately eligible to participate in a PRPP. Part-time employees can join the PRPP after completing 24 months of continuous employment. When they are eligible, employees are automatically enrolled in the plan chosen by a participating employer. An employee who does not wish to join the PRPP must opt out within 60 days of notification of enrollment. For .5.3.2 PRPP contributions. Employee and employer contributions are not mandatory. They are made as a deduction from payroll earnings, 
This contribution at source helps encourage savings. The maximum limit for an annual contribution is equal to the RRSP contribution limit. Transfers to the PRPP can be made from an individual's RRSP, Registered Retirement Income Fund, RRIF, or Deferred Profit Sharing Plan, DPSP. Contributions are invested according to the choices made available by the plan administrator. For .5.3.3 PRPP benefits. Funds are locked in, with the same restrictions as other locked-in pension savings. Therefore, retirement income will be determined by how much is saved, when contributions are made, investment performance, and which transfer choice is used for the locked-in funds. For point six employer-provided savings plans. Savings plans are made available to employees from employers as Deferred Profit Sharing Plans, DPSPs, and Group Registered Retirement Savings Plan, GRRSPs. Savings in these plans are not locked in. They are not governed by pension standards legislation. 4.6.1 Deferred Profit Sharing Plan, DPSP, a DPSP, is offered by companies to share a portion of their business profits with employees who are plan members. For .6.1.1 DPSP eligibility the sponsor of the DPSP decides which employees are eligible for plan membership. Significant shareholders of the company and their close family members are not eligible. For .6.1.2 DPSP contributions contributions are made only by the employer. There is no minimum required contribution. Contributions have a maximum limit, which is the lesser of 18% of a member's annual compensation or 50% of the DCPP limit. Vesting is provided in a maximum of two years. The value of a DPSP is not locked in, and a withdrawal may be made while the plan member is still employed. The plan member controls how the value of the account is invested. Contributions create a pension adjustment, that is, they reduce available RRSP contribution room. All withdrawals are taxable to the employee at the same rate as regular income. For .6.1.3 DPSP benefits when a DPSP member retires or moves to another employer, he can, Black Small Square receive the proceeds of the plan as a lump sum, Black Small Square purchase an annuity, Black Small Square transfer funds to an RRSP or RIF. On retirement, a member can begin to receive income payments from the plan. A plan member who is not retiring may also transfer the value of the plan to another RPP or DPSP. 4.6.2 Group Registered Retirement Savings Plan, GRRSP, a GRRSP is identical to an Individual Registered Retirement Savings Plan, RRSP, except offered on a group basis. Doing so enables members to pay lower fees on their group plan than they would pay on an individual plan. However, there may be fewer investment choices in a GRRSP. A GRRSP also offers the benefit of being a payroll savings plan in which a member can enjoy the long-term advantages of regular savings. Because the plan is an RRSP, RRSP features such as the Home Buyer's Plan, HBP, or Lifelong Learning Plan, LLP, may be available to plan members with a GRRSP. For .6.2.1 GRRSP eligibility, contributions and benefits there are no restrictions on GRRSP eligibility. Contributions are made by the employee and can be made by the employer. Employee contributions are tax deductible for the employee. Employer contributions are taxable income for the employee. Contributions to both personal RRSP and GRRSP cannot exceed an individual's total RRSP deduction limit for the year. Plan value is not locked in. Transfer options include Black Small Square Members Personal RRSP or RRIF, Black Small Square Annuity, Black Small Square Cash. 4.7 Individual Registered Savings Plans Individual Registered Savings Plans are personal investment accounts that are registered with the Canada Revenue Agency, CRA, by the institution that holds the plan's account. Registration with the CRA enables the plan owner to receive tax benefits that are not available in non-registered accounts. Registered plans are available to save for Black Small Square Retirement in an RRSP and RRIF, Black Small Square Tax-Free Saving and Investing in a TFSA, 
Black Small Square Cost of Post-Secondary Education, in an RESP, Black Small Square Costs of Long-Term Disability, in an RDSP. 4.7.1 Registered Retirement Savings Plan, RRSP, just as registered pension plans that are transferred into locked-in accounts have a savings phase and income phase, registered savings plans are similarly structured. Registered Retirement Savings Plans, RRSPs, are the savings phase. The income phase begins when the RRSP matures at the end of the year in which the plan owner turns 71 and its value is rolled into a Registered Retirement Income Fund, RRIF, or an annuity. The plan can be wound up at any time and its value received in cash. RRSPs are a voluntary savings program that were introduced to encourage saving for retirement through tax incentives. They may hold segregated funds when the RRSP is offered by life insurance companies. There are three types of accounts available. A managed account, the investor decides between investments that are typically restricted to guaranteed investment certificates, GICs, mutual funds, and segregated funds when the account is offered by an insurer. A self-directed account, the investor has a wide choice of investments including all those available through a managed account plus many others such as stocks, bonds and exchange-traded funds, ETFs. A fully managed account, a professional money manager creates and manages a customized investment portfolio. Only available to those with a large dollar value portfolio or some available to invest. There are three kinds of fees that can be charged against an RRSP by the financial institution holding the account. Black Small Square Administrative or Trustee fees cover the financial institution's cost of looking after the account. Black Small Square Investment fees can be charged, depending on the investment, for buying, selling and switching investments. Black Small Square Account Change fees may be charged for closing the account, changing the withdrawal schedule, and or making a lump sum withdrawal. A person can own as many RRSP accounts as he wishes. However, each account may charge an administration fee. To eliminate duplicate fees, account owners typically try to limit the number of their RRSP accounts. Regardless of the number of accounts, the maximum contribution limit for the year across all accounts cannot be exceeded. An RRSP can reveal many characteristics of its owner. Black Small Square investments in the account reveal his risk tolerance. Black Small Square the form of account, managed or self-directed, can show investment experience or investment knowledge. Black Small Square contributions indicate dedication to savings and concern for retirement income. Black Small Square contributions post-retirement indicate in use contribution room is available and in the absence of contributing income from work, savings are being redirected from non-registered accounts. Black Small Square contributions to a spousal plan may indicate a need to create a spousal retirement income and slash or a desire to split retirement income and reduce tax. RRSPs provide the following tax advantages. Black Small Square the contribution made to the RRSP account can be deducted from federal and provincial income tax and may move the taxpayer to a lower tax bracket, thus lowering his marginal tax rate. Black Small Square the investment income earned in the account is not taxed until it is withdrawn. This leaves a larger sum in the account to invest and grow. Those with RRSP accounts may use the value in their accounts for the Home Buyer's Plan, HBP, and Lifelong Learning Plan, LLP. Both plans allow the plan owner to make a tax-free withdrawal from the RRSP account. The HBP requires the withdrawal to be used when buying or building a qualifying home for the individual or a related person with a disability. The LLP withdrawal is used for the purpose of financing full-time education or training for an adult or his spouse. Both plans limit the amount that can be withdrawn and specify the conditions for use of the funds and repayment. If repayment does not occur according to the terms of the plan, it can be added to taxable income as a penalty. For .7.1.1 RRSP Eligibility and Contributions In order to contribute to a personal RRSP, one must Black Small Square contribute before reaching the maximum age limit, which is December 31st of the year the account owner turns 71 years of age. 
Black Small Square have earned income for the previous year. Black Small Square have filed an income tax return for the previous year in which business or employment income was declared. Black Small Square have contribution room available from a previous year because the account owner did not make his maximum contribution in that year. In this way, RRSP contribution room is carried forward to subsequent years and is formally called the carry forward provision. Contributions can be made to an RRSP throughout the year. The CRA establishes a date, usually 60 days after December 31st, as the cutoff date for contributions for the previous year. The annual contribution limit is the lesser of Black Small Square 18% of earned income for the previous year. Black Small Square maximum dollar limit established for the year. Earned income is income received from salaries and wages, employment bonuses, alimony, rental income and business income. It does not include income received from investments or pension benefits. Sarah has been earning $40,000 per year in her job at a call center for the last two years. She is able to save about $1,000 per year in her RRSP. She could contribute up to $7,200 per year based on her income, $40,000 times 18%. The $6,200 difference, $7,200 to $1,000, between her contribution and her contribution limit is not used. Thanks to the carry-forward provision of the RRSP, the difference accumulates and rolls over to be available in future years. In five years, based on her same income and level of annual contribution, Sarah will have $31,000, $6,200 times 5, in contribution room. An individual's annual contribution limit is reduced by Black Small Square Pension Adjustment, the amount contributed to an RPP or DPSP in the previous year. Black Small Square Spousal Plan Contribution In addition to the sum that can be contributed to an RRSP annually, the plan owner could use carry-forward contribution room that was created by not making the maximum contribution in previous years. A one-time over-contribution of $2,000 is also permitted. The over-contribution is not tax-deductible and grows on a tax-deferred basis. If a plan owner contributes more than the permitted $2,000, a 1% penalty tax is applied monthly against the excess contribution. When funds are transferred into an RRSP from a DPSP, GRRSP, or another RRSP, the transfer is not considered a contribution. For .7.1.2 Spousal RRSP Plan A spousal or common law partner RRSP is funded by a spouse, husband, wife or common law partner, who has earned income, and RRSP contribution room for the benefit of his spouse. The spousal plan is a way to move income from one spouse who has a higher tax rate to the other who has a lower tax rate during retirement. Splitting or attributing income in this manner can reduce the couple's total income tax. Contributions to a spousal plan are based on the contribution room of the contributor and reduce his RRSP contribution room. Example. Julie has available contribution room of $9,600 this year for her RRSP. She sets up a spousal RRSP for her common-law partner, Tony. She deposits $2,500 to Tony's spousal RRSP. Julie's contribution to her own RRSP now cannot exceed $7,100, $9,600 to $2,500. When they retire, Julie will be in a higher tax bracket than Tony because she has pension benefits and other private income. If she had not set up the plan for Tony, all her RRSP withdrawals would be taxed at her marginal tax rate as income. However, through the spousal plan, withdrawals from Tony's plan will be taxed at his marginal tax rate, which is lower than Julie's. If the spouse who has received funds into his RRSP from the other makes a withdrawal from the plan in the year the deposit is made or the two calendar years following that year, the amount of withdrawal, up to the amount contributed, will be added to the contributing spouse's taxable income in the year of the withdrawal. In other words, if the withdrawal is a combination of contributed money and growth on that money, only the contributed portion of the withdrawal is attributed back to the donor spouse 
not the growth portion. Having a spousal RRSP can extend the tax benefit of contributions past age 71 if the recipient spouse is younger. Contributions can be made until the younger spouse reaches the end of the year in which he turns 71, at which time his RRSP matures. For .7.1.3 RRSP withdrawals. Withdrawals can be made from an RRSP at any time. The financial institution holding the account is required to hold back a portion of the withdrawal in a withholding tax. This represents an advance payment against tax, but will likely not be the full amount of tax that will be owed on the withdrawal. There may be more tax owed in addition to the withholding tax, and the balance owing will be calculated when the income tax return is filed. There are separate withholding tax rates for Quebec and the rest of Canada. The withholding rate increases in proportion to the withdrawal, as illustrated by Table 4.1. Table 4.1 Federal Withholding Tax on RRSP Withdrawals 28 Withdrawal Federal Withholding Tax Outside Quebec Federal Withholding Tax in Quebec for .7.1. For RRSP maturity. At the end of the year in which an RRSP account owner turns 71, he must transfer the funds in the account into an income-paying account so that tax continues to be deferred. Alternatively, he can cash out the RRSP and pay tax on the proceeds of the account. Income-paying options, also called maturity options, include a registered retirement income fund RRIF, account. Investments in the RRSP can be transferred in kind to the RRIF, in which case they are simply switched from the RRSP to the RRIF without having to be sold. This would be true if the RRSP was invested in segregated funds, for instance. The segregated funds are transferred from the RRSP to the RRIF. The other transfer options at maturity are a term annuity to age 90 and a life annuity. Either option requires the investments in the RRSP to be sold so the cash can be used to pay for the annuity. It is not necessary to pick only one option. Funds in the RRSP can be split across options, for instance, a RRIF and a life annuity. The plan owner may want some future flexibility in regard to income, and this is satisfied by the RRIF. He uses the annuity to provide a guaranteed income stream for life. For .7.1.5 Death of RRSP Owner An RRSP can name a qualified beneficiary or a beneficiary, including the estate, to receive the account value when the RRSP owner dies. A qualified beneficiary of an RRSP is the plan owner's spouse or common-law partner, or a child or grandchild who is financially dependent because he has physical or mental impairment. This choice of beneficiary continues the tax deferral of the account. When a qualified beneficiary is named for the plan, the value of the RRSP at the time of death of the plan owner is transferred to the beneficiary and reported on the beneficiary's tax return for that year. If the beneficiary is a spouse who then contributes the amount received to an RRSP, RRIF, PRPP, SPP, or qualifying annuity in the year it is received, or within 60 days thereafter, the spouse can claim a tax deduction to offset the income received. A financially dependent disabled child has the same transfer options as the spouse, RRSP, PRPP, SPP, RRIF, annuity, plus an option to contribute to a registered disability savings plan, RDSP. Beneficiaries are not restricted to spouses or children, anyone can be named a beneficiary of an RRSP. In this case, the account will be collapsed. The CRA considers that the deceased account owner received the fair market value, FMV, of all the property held in the RRSP at the time of death. The tax return for the deceased will include this amount and any other proceeds received from the plan in the year of death. Therefore, it is included in the income of the deceased and tax is paid by the estate. 4.7.2 Registered Retirement Income Fund, RRIF Registered Retirement Income Funds, RIFs, are an income-paying maturity option for RRSPs. A RRIF is funded by transferring the value of an RRSP account, no other contributions are permitted. 
ARRIF continues tax deferral on the RRSP account. Like an RRSP account owner, an individual with a RRIF account is responsible for making decisions about the type of account, managed or self-directed, he will have. The same investment options are available in a RRIF as an RRSP. For .7.2.1 RRIF withdrawals, a RRIF account owner, who is called the annuitant, is required to make a minimum annual withdrawal from his account. There is no withholding tax on the minimum withdrawal, but it will be considered taxable income when his income tax return is filed for the year. A withholding tax applies to any amount of withdrawal in excess of the minimum. The minimum withdrawal amount is a percentage of the account that increases with age, as illustrated in Table 4.2. The percentage charged is based on the value of the RRIF and age of the account owner on January 1st. Withdrawals can be based on the age of a younger spouse and will make the account last longer if the minimum is withdrawn because a smaller percentage of account value is taken. During the coronavirus pandemic in March 2020, the annual withdrawal requirements for RIFs were temporarily reduced. This illustrates that changes can be made to such programs, they are not carved in stone. An agent should always ensure his information is accurate and up-to-date before sharing it with a client. Table for point two minimum yearly withdrawal from RRIF. The same rate as interest. Therefore, there is no tax advantage to investing in equities in an RRSP or RRIF. The advantage of equities lies in their potentially higher rates of return and their potential to increase overall account growth and value. The minimum withdrawal does not need to be taken in cash. Just like an input to a RRIF from an RRSP can be made in kind so, too, can an in-kind transfer be made out of the RRIF. In-kind means that the RRIF account owner can take his investment and transfer it to a non-registered investment account or tax-free savings account. TFSA. He does not need to sell the investment prior to transfer. For instance, to satisfy the minimum annual RRIF withdrawal, a mutual fund in the RRIF could be transferred into the TFSA. However, taxation applies as if the transferred sum was taken in cash. There is no maximum on what can be taken from the RRIF account, and this can provide the account owner with flexibility and the ability to meet unanticipated expenses. It can also cause the account to be depleted at a faster rate than anticipated and is therefore subject to longevity risk. For .7.2.2 death of RRIF owner. Unlike an RRSP, a RRIF is oriented towards regular income payments. The person who receives those payments is the annuitant. When the annuitant dies, a successor annuitant of the account can receive those payments. The successor annuitant must be a spouse or common-law partner. A successor annuitant has several choices for using the proceeds. Black small square he can replace the deceased as holder of the RRIF and continues to receive the payments made to the deceased or Black small square he can transfer the assets in kind into his own RRIF and continue to receive the payments made to the deceased or Black small square he can roll the RRIF assets in kind into his RRSP. Doing this does not affect the survivor's contribution room. There are no tax consequences to the estate when there is a successor annuitant. Alternatively, a spouse or common law partner, plus a child or grandchild who is dependent because of a physical or mental impairment can be named as a qualifying beneficiary. Just as any Anyone can be named a beneficiary of an RRSP, so too can any person be named beneficiary of a RRIF. A beneficiary will not have to pay tax income on any amount paid out of the RRIF if it has been included in the deceased annuitant's income. If a beneficiary is not named, the value of the RRIF becomes part of the estate and subject to probate fees according to the province in which the estate is based. The value of the RRIF is included as income on the RRIF holder's final tax return and taxed accordingly. For point 7.3 point Tax-Free Savings Account, TFSA Tax-Free Savings Accounts, TFSAs, 
are precisely what their name says, a savings account that is tax-free. That means the investment return earned by deposits to the account, example, capital gains, and withdrawals are not taxable. A TFSA can be used for any savings goal. TFSAs can be opened by a person age 18 or older with a valid social insurance number. A TFSA is a registered account. It is highly suitable for those whose withdrawals from registered savings have already been taxed and who are seeking a means to avoid further taxation on their money. For example, a RRIF withdrawal is taxed. Its account owner may not need the entire withdrawal for living expenses. If the money is deposited to a non-TFSA and earns investment growth, the account owner will be taxed again on that growth. On the other hand, if the money is deposited to a TFSA, there will be no future tax. Segregated Funds and Annuities Chapter 4 Investor Profile 154 For .7.3.1 TFSA Contributions Contributions to a TFSA are not tax deductible. There is an annual dollar limit for TFSA contributions. However, the amount contributed is not based on earned income, like an RRSP is. Therefore, a person who is not working and receives money can deposit the money to a TFSA. He would not be able to contribute to an RRSP because he did not earn RRSP contribution room. Example Sandy retired last year. This year she is not working. Her aunt died during the year and left Sandy an inheritance of $50,000. Sandy cannot deposit the sum to an RRSP because she does not have earned income and has no available carry-forward contribution room. However, she can deposit it to a TFSA in an amount equal to her and use TFSA contribution room. The TFSA account provides a wide range of investment options similar to those available in an RRSP including GICs, stocks, bonds, mutual funds and segregated funds. Contribution room not used in any year is carried forward, like an RRSP. Overcontributions have been known to occur when a withdrawal and deposit are made in a single year. Overcontributions are penalized. There is a charge of 1% per month on an excess contribution until a withdrawal of the excess is made. If an overcontribution is deemed to be deliberate, any investment gains on the excess are taxed at a rate of 100%. To ensure no penalty will be charged, it is best that no deposit be made in the same year as a withdrawal. For .7.3.2 TFSA withdrawals A withdrawal can be made at any time. It can be recontributed in any year following the year of the withdrawal, in addition to the maximum dollar amount of contribution for that year. No tax is due on the withdrawal. Income earned in a TFSA and withdrawals from the account do not affect eligibility for federal income-tested benefits, such as Old Age Security, OAS, and the Guaranteed Income Supplement, GIS. A TFSA in the common law provinces can name a successor holder to continue to receive benefits of the account if the owner dies and or name a beneficiary. In Quebec, the account value passes through the will to inheritors. If a spouse is named inheritor of the TFSA, he can roll the account into his personal account without affecting and use contribution room if the spouse does so within the allotted period of time and with the requisite CRA form. The successor holder must be a spouse or common law partner. He becomes the account owner and the account continues. A designated beneficiary can receive the account value and pay tax only on the growth of the account between the death of the account owner and the time of inheritance. For point seven point for Registered Education Savings Plan, RESP. A Registered Education Savings Plan, RESP, is a registered plan to encourage savings that will pay towards costs of higher education. Although typically used for children, they can be used for a person of any age. Savings in an RESP account grow tax-deferred, contributions are not tax-deductible. The person who opens the plan is called the subscriber. The person who receives payments from the RESP is called its beneficiary. People invest in RESPs to save in advance for the cost of post-secondary education, such as college or university, for their children. 
A plan can be opened immediately after a child's birth once a social insurance number has been obtained. Contributing to a plan qualifies the plan to receive a generous government grant that does not need to be repaid if the child pursues higher education. For dot seven dot for dot one types of RESPs. There are two providers of RESPs, financial institutions and scholarship plan dealers. The RESPs offered by scholarship plan dealers are beyond the scope of this manual. However, agents should be aware that the RESPs they can provide have many advantages, such as investment and contribution flexibility, that the scholarship plans do not. Individual and family RESPs are available through financial institutions. An individual plan has a single beneficiary. Anyone can open the plan and contribute to it. A family plan can have more than one beneficiary, and each beneficiary must be related to the subscriber. For dot seven dot for dot two resp contributions, there is a lifetime contribution limit per beneficiary of fifty thousand dollars, regardless of whether the resp is an individual or family plan. Contributions are not tax deductible. Contributions must be made to the plan in order to qualify for the Canada Education Savings Grant (CESG) and the Canada Learning Bond. The CESG is paid by the federal government to top up individual contributions. Regardless of the level of family income, the maximum basic CESG is $500 per year. The grant is not repaid to the government if the beneficiary pursues post-secondary education. There is a maximum amount per beneficiary that can be received from the grant over the entire period of account ownership. The application for the CESG is made by the financial institution in which the RESP account is opened. The CESG is an excellent opportunity to help save for post-secondary education. An additional CESG may be paid into an RESP account for low-income and middle-income families. If the total amount of grant for any one year is not received, it accumulates and can be carried forward until the end of the year in which the beneficiary turns 17. The Canada Learning Bond pays an additional grant to low-income subscribers. Some provinces also offer savings incentives for post-secondary education costs. Contributions in the plan account can be invested according to the products offered by the financial institution that holds the account. A wide variety of investment options are typically available. Tax is not paid on the value of the plan, including investment growth, until withdrawals begin. For dot seven dot for dot three resp withdrawals and resp beneficiary, i.e., the student receives withdrawals from the plan as educational assistance payments (EAPs). EAPs are paid only when the student is enrolled in a qualifying educational program. An EAP consists of a portion of the Canada Education Savings Grant, the Canada Learning Bond, any amount paid under a provincial education savings program, and the earnings on the money saved in the RESP. Withdrawals are taxed in the hands of the beneficiary. Since most students have very little income, the EAPs are usually tax-free. 4.7.5 Registered Disability Savings Plan, RDSP, the Registered Disability Savings Plan, RDSP, is a registered savings plan introduced to help parents and others save towards long-term financial needs of a child or person with a severe and prolonged impairment in physical or mental functions. For dot seven dot five dot one RDSP eligibility a disabled person is eligible to be a beneficiary who, black small square is eligible for the disability tax credit Disability amount, black small square is a Canadian resident, black small square is under 60 years of age, if 59, the individual must apply before the end of the calendar year in which he turns 59, black small square has a social insurance number. For dot seven dot five dot two RDSP contributions. Contributions are not tax deductible. There is a lifetime private contribution limit for an RDSP of $200,000. There is no annual contribution limit. Private contributions result from regular savings, lump sum contributions such as an inheritance or life insurance policy death benefit, or a rollover from a deceased individual's RRSP, RRIF or RPP. The federal government may pay a matching Canada disability savings grant of up to 300% of private contributions, depending on the amount contributed, 
and the beneficiary's family income. There is a maximum annual grant and a lifetime limit. Grants are paid into the RDSP until the end of the calendar year in which the beneficiary turns 49. The government may also pay a Canada Disability Savings Bond every year into the RDSPs of low-income and modest-income individuals subject to a lifetime limit. The bond is paid into an RDSP even if no contributions were made to the plan. Bonds are paid into the RDSP until the end of the calendar year in which the beneficiary turns 49. There is a carry-forward provision to the plan, and used grant and bond entitlements from the past 10 years can be claimed for existing RDSPs, or RDSPs opened in January 2011 or later. The amount of grant and bond depends on the beneficiary's family income in those years. The grant amount that is received also depends on how much is contributed to the RDSP. Grants and bonds are paid on and used entitlements up to an annual maximum. For .7.5.3 RDSP payments, only the beneficiary of the RDSP or his or her legal representative may receive payments. There are two types of payments that can be taken from an RDSP. The first type of payment is the Disability Assistance Payment, DAP. The DAP is a single payment. It can be received only if private contributions to the plan are greater than government contributions. The second type of payment from the plan is called the Lifetime Disability Assistance Payment, LDAP. The LDAP is a series of payments. Once the plan beneficiary requests an LDAP, these payments are made to the beneficiary at least annually until plan termination or death. This payment must begin no later than the beneficiary's age 60. Investment income earned in the plan accumulates tax-free. However, grants, bonds and investment income earned in the plan are included in the beneficiary's income for tax purposes when paid out of the RDSP. For point 8 investor profile the sum of all information collected in the profile provides the big picture of the financial situation of the client. That picture comes completely into focus when black small square financial results are analyzed, black small square needs are identified, black small square risks are determined. For point 8.1 results of financial review the financial review shows black small square how much has been saved black small square how much is available to meet current and future needs and objectives, black small square income restrictions, such as for locked in accounts, black small square whether new plans and accounts need to be opened, black small square the performance of current investments. This review shows whether the current approach to saving and investing is suitable and will meet investor objectives or whether changes should be implemented. It provides quantitative information, more precisely the amounts available and needed. A new strategy could be formulated as a result of this review to address weaknesses that have been identified and move the investor closer to his goals. For point 8.2 results of needs review the needs review is oriented more towards qualitative information, more precisely, what is important to the investor. The investor should prioritize his needs so that the needs can be combined with financial data and objectives can be set. For point 8.3 determination of risk tolerance, risk tolerance and risk capacity are the elements that form an investor's risk profile. It is essential for the agent to assess the risk profile accurately. To do this, the agent takes both elements into account and compares them against the risk of an investment. He analyzes the answers to, what is the client's attitude towards losing money from his investment? This forms the basis for determining risk tolerance. Can he afford losses, and if so, how much? This forms the basis for risk capacity. What is the stated risk level of the investment? The objective is to match risk that is suitable for the investor with the risk of the product. Arriving at the answers to these questions requires the agent to understand some essentials about risk and its closely related subject investment returns. Investment risk tolerance describes how an investor feels about the potential for a loss in his invested principal. It is typically stated on a spectrum. Zero risk tolerance is at one end of the spectrum, and the highest risk tolerance is at the other, medium risk falls between the two. 
Fund investments plot five measures on the risk scale, low, medium low, medium, medium high, and high. An investor indicates which of those measures matches up with his personal risk tolerance or his agent guides him to the correct match through a needs analysis. Therefore, when it is determined that an investor has medium low risk tolerance, the most suitable investment for him is one that is rated as medium low or lower. Gauging an investor's risk tolerance is a risky business. Many psychological factors come into play, and it is dodgy to rely solely on the investor's own opinion of his risk tolerance. Individual investors are well known to significantly and consistently overestimate their risk tolerance. They are also prone to saying one thing and doing another. This is shown by investors who say they have low risk tolerance but invest in medium-high or high-risk investments, like an equity fund. Rating risk tolerance requires an agent to take time in client discussions to try and understand investor motivation, fears, and hopes to try and arrive at an accurate assessment of where the investor really stands and not just where he says he stands. Risk tolerance is a factor that can change over time and should be regularly reviewed in client meetings. A change in income, age, marital status, or occupation could increase or decrease the investor's risk tolerance. Example Alex believes that he can tolerate some risk in his investments, and when asked by his advisor, Morris, Alex states he has a medium-high risk tolerance. Alex's interpretation of medium-high means he would accept up to an 8% loss in his invested capital. Morris's interpretation of medium-high risk tolerance is up to a 15% loss in invested capital. If Morris proceeds to invest Alex's money on this basis, Alex's risk tolerance will be exceeded. Exceeded. Alex may result in taking on far more risk than he actually wants. Furthermore, the agent cannot be guided by the risks that the investor adopts in his life or lifestyle choices as an indicator of financial risk tolerance. One body of research indicates that people who choose risk elsewhere, such as riding a motorcycle or skydiving, will adopt an equal level of risk in their investing choices. Other research suggests the two, life choices and financial choices, are entirely separate and high tolerance in one does not translate into high tolerance in the other. This latter view is the more conservative approach and one that is safer to adopt when counseling an appropriate level of risk. Investors may also have differing degrees of risk tolerance for differing investment objectives. Some objectives, like saving for retirement, may be non-negotiable when it comes to how much loss the investor is prepared to accept. Others, like saving for a holiday, may present a higher tolerance for risk. The investor's time horizon should be associated with his risk tolerance. Typically, the shorter the time horizon, the lower the tolerance for risk. This is because time is the best friend of money, the more time available for investing the better the probability that invested money will grow and earn a positive return. When time is short, the investor does not have the luxury of waiting for a loss to turn around. He cannot afford to lose. Therefore, his risk tolerance is zero or very low. Example Sally and Mark are saving for their retirement, which they now anticipate will happen in three years. When they retire they will be depending on their retirement savings in their RRSPs since neither has a private pension. It is essential that their savings are not diminished and correspondingly, they do not want to incur investment losses. If they did, they would have to delay retirement because they would need to work longer to make up for those losses. Therefore, they have zero risk tolerance. Investors are known to accept or even pursue risk, sometimes at a level unsuitable to their actual tolerance for losses, because higher risk investments may pay better returns than low risk investments. This is the basis for the investing principle that states that risk and return are directly related. According to this principle, the higher the risk, the higher the return and vice versa, the lower the risk, the lower the return. Investors are, in effect, rewarded for taking on added risk. However, the investor must understand that investments that pay higher returns are more likely to lose money. An investment portfolio can be structured to be low risk, and it will focus on safe investments. Returns will be modest but likely dependable. As risk in a portfolio increases, 
so too do the potential for greater returns and greater losses. Suitability in assessing investor risk tolerance and risk capacity is key. As individual investments are carefully selected that are suitable for the investor, the portfolio will also be suited to the investor's risk profile at that point in time. As time passes, the individual investments and the portfolio may lose suitability and adjustments should be made to bring it in line to re-establish suitability. Paul is saving for his retirement in 10 years. Achieving a better rate of return on his investments now could mean an earlier retirement date or more money available to him and his wife during retirement. He realizes that a low-risk investment right now will barely keep ahead of the rate of inflation, and he makes the decision to risk investing in a blue-chip Canadian equity fund rated as medium risk. Therefore, Paul has medium risk tolerance. The fund's historical rate of return over the preceding 10 years is 9%. There is no guarantee that rate of return will continue, and Paul could suffer significant losses if the equity markets have a downturn. However, by holding his savings in a segregated fund he is protected against losses to a maximum of 25% of his investment. The other aspect of the risk profile is risk capacity. Capacity is a measure of how much the investor can afford to lose without impacting his objectives or lifestyle. Risk capacity is an especially important consideration for investors who are approaching retirement or retired. They no longer have the ability to replace money lost in an investment because they are near the end of their careers or living on a fixed income. Those who cannot afford losses should restrict investing to the most safe, low-risk, guaranteed investments. An investor who can afford to lose principal because he still has earning power will be able to participate in investments with more risk if he has the risk tolerance to do so. So, even though an investor may have the capacity for risk, he may not be risk tolerant. The two risk factors, tolerance and capacity, are measured entirely separately from each other one should not influence an assessment of the other. Example 1. Tim has significant assets, a home valued at $3.3 million, a generous pension based on his executive salary, an RRSP with a balance of over $800,000 and non-registered accounts valued at $2.7 million. Even though Tim has a high capacity for risk because, by any measure, he is a wealthy man, he has low risk tolerance. He invests in low-risk to medium-low-risk investments because he is not comfortable with the idea of losing any of his hard-earned savings. Example 2. June is retired and living on government retirement pensions and savings of $25,000. June keeps her savings in a high-interest savings account at her financial institution. June has both zero-risk tolerance and zero-risk capacity. Segregated Funds and Annuities Chapter 4 Investor Profile 162 Some indicators of risk tolerance are Black Small Square Account and Investment Statements Indicate Investment Experience, Knowledge and Acceptance of Volatility Through Existing Investments Black Small Square Acceptance of Risk is demonstrated in the analysis of personal risks Black Small Square Accounts in place and their level of funding show an approach to being risk-ready Black small square age and circumstances indicate an ability to recover losses. 4.8 point for investor profile goal the agent demonstrates his capability by methodically working through all the elements of the investor profile in order to make recommendations based on facts and requirements. Suitable recommendations are the result of the agent's analysis and the goal the agent must seek. Chapter 5 Segregated Fund and Annuity Recommendation Competency Components Black Small Square Analyze the available products that meet the client's needs. Black Small Square Implement a recommendation adapted to the client's needs and situation. Competency Subcomponents Black Small Square Analyze the types of investments that can constitute a segregated fund and that meet the client's needs. Black Small Square Propose a recommendation adapted to the client's needs and situation.